Chapter Twenty of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reverend Pentland Corn. Herrick did not take all that Santiago had said for gospel truth. The Mexican was too clever and too bold a man to give in so tamely, seeing what was at stake. For the moment, he had recognized that he was powerless and had surrendered until such time as he could recover his position. Dr. Jim could have stopped all his machinations by having him arrested for the assault on Stephen, but he did not wish to bring the police into the matter at present. In the first place, so many lies had been told about the case, there were so many things to be explained, that he was not sure of his ground. And for the sake of Stephen, he did not wish to create a scandal. Colonel Carr's reputation was quite bad enough without making it worse. Therefore, the only thing that Jim could do was to have the two scamps watched. Certainly, they might warn Frisco to clear out. But whatever Santiago did, Herrick felt sure that Joyce would not counsel such a course. The little man knew well enough that his safety depended upon Herrick and would do nothing which might jeopardize his safety. The Mexican might plot and plan, but Joyce would certainly obey orders. Also, they could do little if closely watched. Herrick then gave orders to Kidd and Belcher, and returned the next day to Saxon. If anything important occurs, he said to the ferret, you can wire me. But we are in the dark, protested Belcher, if you would only... No, Belcher, interrupted Jim sharply. We settled all that before. All you have to do is to see if either of these men tries to leave the country, or if they meet a man who looks like a sailor. Then you can wire me. I shall come up to town at once and deal with the matter myself. What might be the sailor's name? It might be anything, replied Herrick dryly. It won't do, Belcher. You are not to know my aims until I choose to let you know. If you will not work with me on these terms, just say so, and I'll get someone else. I'll do whatever you like, Dr. Herrick, said the ferret submissively, and went away to fulfill his duties devoured with curiosity. In spite of his regard for Dr. Jim, the man wanted to make money out of him. He therefore determined to learn all he could about Joyce and the Mexican and treat with them on his own account if he gained any knowledge likely to be useful from a blackmailing point of view. The ferret and his partner were rogues in grain. They did not even keep faithful to their employer, or to each other, for the matter of that. Honor amongst thieves was not a proverb practiced in the Strand office. Herrick had another talk with Joyce before he returned to Saxon. The little man had gone back to his flat, having him all to himself, and the yoke of Don Manuel being to some extent broken, Dr. Jim was able to deal more easily with him. He promised the poor fool that if he remained faithful and did not intrigue any more with his father or the Mexican, that he should be given a new chance of leading a clean existence. Indeed, Herrick spoke so seriously that he reduced Joyce to tears and the many protestations that henceforth he would be all that was good. It was not improbable that he would mend. He had had a severe lesson and had narrowly escaped getting into the clutches of the law. With a less kindly man than Herrick, his position would indeed have been a serious one. He therefore appreciated the kindness accorded to him, or said he did, and Jim departed satisfied that so far as Robin was concerned, he had nullified the schemes of Santiago. In this way he hoped to take the heart out of the conspiracy against Stephen and Stephen's money. The next person to deal with is corn, he said to himself, as he got into the train. He's another fool, if not worse, as Manuel told me. I seem to have dealt with nothing but fools and scoundrels, ever since I started out on that unhappy walking tour. Colonel Carr was evil in his life, and he has left an evil influence behind him. 
Later on, Dr. Jim reproached himself for blaming the walking tour. If it had brought him into trouble, it had also given him a promise of future happiness. But for that walk, he would never have met Bess. After all his anxiety in London, Herrick wanted to have a quiet hour with the girl who was the light of his eyes. Jim did not call her this, for he was not a romantic person, but he felt that he would like to be with her, and he was anxious to know what she had discovered about the pistol. Bess had not sent him a report as she had promised, and Herrick concluded that she had discovered nothing worth the sending. All the same, he wished to see her at once, but he put off the happy hour. There was business to be done before pleasure could be taken. It was after nine o'clock before Herrick arrived at the Beelminster station. He had not sent for the cart, as he did not wish Stephen to know of his arrival at present. Dr. Jim had made up his mind to call in and get the truth out of the clergyman before returning to the Pines. Therefore, determined to get his plans in thorough order, Jim left his portmanteau at Beelminster to be sent on the next morning and himself walked to Saxon. In due time he arrived at the rectory and was shown into the rector's study, where he found the man himself. The Reverend Pentland looked nervous at this untimely visit, and more so as he saw that Dr. Jim was not in evening dress and must therefore have come straight from town. Corn's conscience was uneasy, and every untold event fluttered his nerve. However, he composed himself with a strong effort and asked Herrick to be seated. "'You have just come from town, I see,' he observed, with a nervous glance. "'Yes, and I want particularly to have a chat with you before going to the Pines. And on a painful subject, Mr. Corn. The rector shivered and turned even paler than usual. Is there anything wrong? he asked faintly. Let me know the worst at once. Why should you expect any worst, Mr. Corn? The man shook his head and passed a handkerchief across his dry lips. I want to know the worst, he said again, without heeding the question. I can see by your face that there is something wrong which concerns me. Herrick gave a short laugh. Upon my word, you are a singularly indiscreet man, Mr. Corn, he said. You give yourself away right and left. When I met you, first of all, you behaved in a foolish manner. Now you are very little better. You are a clergyman and a gentleman with an assured position. Why don't you assume the defensive and ask what I mean by such speeches as I have made? as I am now making. "'Because I would have to tell you all about myself sooner or later,' said Corn in a low voice. "'You are a strong man, and I want to confide in someone like yourself. I am not strong. I was once, but something happened.' He sighed and nodded. "'A terrible thing happened.' Herrick wondered if he was about to confess to the murder. However, he did not wish to hurry the confession which he saw Corn was on the point of making. He wondered that such a smart and soldierly-looking man should own himself to be so weak. I am quite at your service, he said coldly, and as for my part, Mr. Corn, I do not think you have used either myself or Mr. Marsh over well. In what way? This time Corn really did look amazed. You told a lie to shield Don Manuel. It was the Mexican who struck that blow at my friend, and you knew it. How could you, a gentleman and a clergyman, stoop to shield a would-be murderer? Corn rose to his feet and braced himself to a great effort. You are right, he said frankly, but I was compelled to such a course. Herrick nodded. I know. I have heard all from Santiago. Corn recoiled. He told you? He grasped, sitting down. Yes, he told me how he held you in his power, how he forced you to lie for him. I made him tell me the truth. Now I wish to hear the confirmation of his story from you. 
"'It is true, it is true,' cried Corn desperately. "'If he told you that I was a gambler, that I owed money, it is true.' "'I don't mean that so much,' said Herrick sharply, "'as to the accusation he makes against you of having murdered Colonel Carr.' The clergyman, who had been leaning his head on his arms in an agony of grief, looked up suddenly with a bewildered stare. "'Santiago said that about me?' he demanded. "'It is not true.' "'It is the foulest lie he ever spoke,' cried Corn with indignation. "'I am bad in many ways, Dr. Herrick. Yet I have my excuses, as you shall hear. But as the murdering car, I did nothing of the sort. How was it, then, that Don Manuel obtained from you the pistol with which the crime was committed? Corn looked round the room and went to the door. Opening this, he looked out for a moment to see that the coast was clear. Then he shut it, locked it, and came back to the fireplace, looking more like a ghost than ever. I picked it up, he said in a whisper. Yes, on the lawn of the pines. I knew that Colonel Carr had been shot with it, but I dare not tell. Why not? Were you afraid of being inculpated? No. Corn hesitated and wiped his face. I must tell you, he said with a gasp, there is no help for it. The secret has weighed on my soul until I can bear it no longer. It was a woman who shot Carr. Herrick rose slowly, hardly believing his ears. A woman? he echoed. Corn nodded and whispered again. Mrs. Marsh, he said. That, said Herrick, is a lie. It is the truth. I swear it's the truth. She shot Carr because he was about to disinherit her son. If you will sit down, I will tell you all I know. I am glad that it has come to this, panted Corn, wiping his forehead. I am glad that I can tell you. The secret has nearly killed me. Did you tell Santiago, asked Dr. Jim, seated again, and much bewildered? No, I told no one. Santiago, on the evidence of that pistol, really believed that I was guilty. But it is a lie, a lie. He used it to force me to hide his wickedness. I protested my innocence, but he would never believe me, and that because I refused to say who was guilty. Herrick placed his hands on the shoulders of the agitated man and forced him into the chair. Come, he said in a more friendly tone. You are not so weak or so bad as I thought, Corn. You took the blame on yourself. Oh, I know you protested your innocence to Santiago. Still, he would always think you guilty. He is not the man to believe that any human being would shield another. Why did you shield Mrs. March? For her son's sake, said Corn, and for the sake of Ida Endicott. Herrick stared. What has she got to do with it? I love her, said Corn, in a low voice, shading his eyes with the palm of his hand. But she told me that her whole life was wrapped up in Stevens. If he knew that his mother had killed Carr, he is quixotic enough to throw up the whole fortune out of shame. Then he would not be able to marry Ida, and her heart would be broken. It is for this reason that I held my peace. Yet you let Stephen be assaulted, said Herrick. His death would have ruined the life of Ida just the same. I did not know about the assault until after it was committed, said Corn quickly. Then Santiago. But I cannot tell you the story in scraps like this. Better let me tell you all about myself and what led to my present weakness. Then you will appreciate what I have gone through. Herrick nodded. It is best so. Go on. You can safely confide in me, Corn. I only retain the right to use such information as may clear up the mystery of this murder. Corn seized his arm. You will not tell about Mrs. Marsh, he panted. Not without consulting you. Be certain, Corn, that I am too true a friend to Stephen to do anything harmful to him. But there is much at stake, and I must be allowed to use my own judgment. You can rely on me. I am sure of that, said the clergyman, in admiration. 
You are a strong-willed man. I was strong myself once, in a way. But my crime... Crime? I thought you had not killed Carr. No, said Corn in a low voice. But I have the blood of a fellow creature on my hands for all that. And he buried his face in his hands. I judge no man, said Herrick, after a pause. But do not tell me anything that may render it difficult for me to keep sacred your confidence. Oh, there's nothing you need fear from that, replied Corn drearily. It was an accident. Wait till I recover myself. The man took a turn up and down the room. After five minutes, he resumed his seat and spoke composedly. My name is not Corn, he began. Langham is my name, Francis Langman. I was in the army. So Bess Endicott said, nodded Herrick. Corn smiled faintly. Yes, I let that slip one day when she was talking of my looking like a soldier. But she does not know my real name. No one does, save the bishop who gave me this living. Ah, he was a good man. He's dead now. I have to thank him for saving my reason and my life. How was that? asked Herrick, settling himself. I was quartered in the West Indies, said Corn after a pause, and I there had a friend, who joined about the same time as I did. I need not tell you his name or the number of my regiment. All you need know is the simple story of my misery. My friend and I were always together. They called us David and Jonathan in the regiment. Well, here Corn nerved himself to a tremendous effort. We were out shooting ducks. We were parted amongst the reeds, on the border of the lake. I thought I saw the brown back of a duck through some reeds. Without thinking, I fired, and I killed my friend. Oh, my God! When the man's head went down on the table, Herrick clasped him by the shoulder. He was profoundly moved by their miserable story, and could well understand how once a strong man had been changed by this tragic deed into a weak, tremulous creature. He did not say a word of comfort. It would have been useless. After a time, Corn recovered himself and continued in a dull, hard voice. There was an inquiry. I was exonerated from all blame. But I knew that I had killed my friend, that I had the blood of a fellow creature on my hands. I left my regiment and sent in my papers. Under another name, I returned to England. All my relations were dead, save my uncle, the bishop. He tried to calm me. I would not be calm. I would have committed suicide, but I felt that it was my duty to suffer for my crime. Not a crime, interposed Herrick gently, an accident. Yes, it was. Yet, I can't help. But no matter. I took to gambling to drown my remorse and grief. I had never touched cards before. They became a passion with me. Other men take to drink. I to cards, but all in vain. When the excitement of the game was over in the morning, then my misery came back. I went to my uncle. He implored me to find peace in the bosom of the church, for he did not look upon me as the guilty wretch I was. I consented. As Pentland Corn, I studied for the church. I became a priest, a curate, and worked in the slums of the East End. I left off gambling and felt more at ease thinking I was expiating my folly. In an evil hour, after years of hard work, my uncle gave me this living. I took it. Shortly afterwards he died. Then I realized the folly of accepting a charge where I had time to brood. The past came back to me, and I took to gambling again. That was weak, Corn, said Herrick decisively. I know it was but I was in a manner driven to it. There was little work to do here. Society had no attractions for me. Then I had long, long hours of agony. I wanted to forget the past, and... You should have gone back to the East End. Corn nodded. I should have done many things, he said bitterly, but that accident had taken all the manhood out of me. I drifted, drifted. 
Well, to make a long story short, I took to going away to London at times to indulge in gambling and forget my sorrow. I know, and you went to that club in Pimlico. I did, Santiago, told you that, I suppose. I met him there. In an incautious moment, I told him about Colonel Carr. Then I heard of the grudge he bore against him. Do you know the story of that expedition? Most of it. I warned Colonel Carr against his enemy. He laughed, feeling safe in his tower. Then, learning that I was fond of cards, Carr made me play with him. It was said I went to the Pines to convert the man. It was the gamble. So low had I sunk. Herrick shook his head, but he was so sorry for the man that he could not blame him for his folly. Corn resumed. Night after night I gambled there. Also I went to London and met Don Manuel at the Pimlico Club. So life went on, and now for the story of that night. Here Corn drew his chair closer to that of his listener, and continued his revelation in a whisper. I knew Mrs. Marsh very well and saw much of her, he said. She was a very violent and terrible woman. I know that, said Herrick, remembering his own experiences. Oftentimes I tried to check her wrath. She would call and see Carr, and they always fought when they met. I think Carr enjoyed tormenting her, for he never forbade her visits. He was a wicked man, Herrick one of the worst, judging from his reputation. Yet he had his good points. He helped me with money to pay my gambling debts, not twice, but thrice. Did he know your story? No, I could not tell it to him. He would only have laughed at my remorse. It would have seemed foolish to him. He thought that I was simply a profligate clergyman, and liked me for that very reason. Oh, I do not defend myself, Herrick. I sank low, very low, but my excuse must be the sorrow of my life. It took all the courage and self-respect out of me. But after this, I shall give up this charge and return to the East End. There I will work hard and forget my folly, my sorrow. The gambling will lose its hold over me then. I think you will be wise. Go on. Well, on that day of the murder, Mrs. Marsh came to me in a rage. She had heard through Frisco, he had spoken in one of his drunken fits, that Carr was going to disinherit her son. She went to see him from this house. I tried to stop her, but she would go. They had a furious quarrel in the afternoon, and Mrs. Marsh swore that she would kill Carr if he disinherited Stephen. She did not kill him in the afternoon. No because he was alive after five o'clock. Someone saw him at the window of the tower. Well, Mrs. Marsh dined with me. After dinner, she worked herself into a rage. Carr had laughed at her on that afternoon, and had said that he would do what he liked with his money. In fact, from all she told me, he treated her like a brute. He was one, you know, Herrick, and Jim nodded, remembering the torture of the Indian. Stephen was to come for her, said the rector wearily. The telling of his story fatigued him. Somewhere about nine o'clock, she was to meet him at the car arms and take the bus back to Beelminster. After eight, she went out. It was so early that I wanted to stop her. She refused. At nine, Stephen arrived. He could not find his mother. She was not at the car arms. I then guessed that she had gone to see Carr again. In my fear, lest she might do something dreadful, I blurted out my suspicions. At once, Stephen understood what I meant. He went himself to the Pines. I waited for some time. Then I was in such a state that I followed. The house was all ablaze, but I heard nothing. This was about half-past nine or a quarter to ten. I went up as far as the door, on the steps, I picked up that pistol, which I guessed had been used by Mrs. Marsh. I slipped it into my pocket, then I returned home. I also went to the car arms and learned that Stephen and his mother had caught the bus some time after nine o'clock. I tried to think that Mrs. Marsh had not shot the man. 
I returned here to think it out. Santiago was waiting for me. He had come by the last bus from Beominster and had been waiting since nine. In fact, he came just after I went after Stephen. It was really a quarter past nine when he came. Do you think he had been to the Pines? asked Herrick keenly. I do not know, but you can learn that from the busman who drove him here. I did not inquire myself. He had come to get me to take him to see Carr. I refused, and without thinking, I threw the pistol on the table. I was much agitated, and he saw that. He got out of me that I had been to the Pines. After looking at the pistol, he said he would go to the Pines himself. I refused to let him go. After a time, I gave him some money and persuaded him to go. I drove him to Heathcroft Station in my cart. He took the pistol with him. I did not notice that he had done so. In a day or so, when the murder became known, he wrote and accused me of being the criminal. I denied it. But he had read the report of the death and how the wound had been inflicted by an old-fashioned weapon. When he came here with Joyce, he insisted that I was guilty. I said that I was not, but would say nothing about Mrs. Marsh. It was this knowledge that he used to make me hold my tongue about the assault on Stephen. What could I do, Herrick? said Corn piteously. Appearances were against me. Santiago could prove that I had the pistol. I had been to the Pines, and I owed Colonel Carr money. Also, there was my own story. Had I been arrested, all would have come out. No, I had to do what Santiago told me. Hmm, said Jim. I can see your dilemma. And what about Mrs. Marsh? Did Stephen suspect her? No, he told me that he had gone to the Pines, looked at the house. He saw nothing and heard nothing. He therefore returned to the car arms and found his mother waiting for him. She said that he had missed her and evidently invented a story which satisfied him. No, Herrick, I do not think Stephen suspected his stepmother, but she shot the colonel, I am sure. She left my house in a rage and she several times threatened to kill him. Then she was not at the car arms. After nine, the man was shot. Herrick nodded. Did you ask Mrs. Marsh to explain? No. She fell ill, if you remember, and took to her bed. I could not bring myself to see her. I therefore held my tongue. And I should have continued to do so, but that Don Manuel threatened me. Therefore I determined to tell you all when I could. What you heard from him is in the main true. But I did not kill Carr. The blood of one human being on my hands is enough. Do you despise me, Herrick? Dr. Jim rose and took the hand of the unhappy man. My friend, I pity you from the bottom of my soul. If you had only found someone to advise you, all this trouble would not have occurred. That is true, but my uncle, who knew the story of my misery, was dead. I shrank from telling anyone. But when I got to know you and saw how strong and self-reliant you were and recognized all the goodness of your heart, I felt that I could safely confide in you. You will not tell anyone what I have told you? Need you ask me that, said Herrick, with a hearty shake of the hand. Of course your secret is safe with me. And about Mrs. Marsh? I shall see into that, said Herrick gravely. Remember Santiago is a dangerous man. I do not know what trouble he may yet cause. If necessary, I must use what you have told me about the crime. But you may be sure that for Stephen's sake and for yours, I shall be circumspect in my dealings with the matter. As for you, my friend, wait here until this mystery is quite solved, then go back to the East End or to the Wild Lands as a missionary. Yes, said Corn with a sigh, I know. Only of that way shall I find rest. The two men shook hands and parted very good friends. Corn returned to his study, intensely relieved by the sympathy and by the fact that he had someone to share his secret. Herrick walked home to the Pines, wondering at the perplexity of the case. He thought less of Corn than of Mrs. Marsh. Suddenly he stopped. 
I see, he said to himself, this was why Mrs. Marsh poisoned herself with an overdose of chloral. Poor woman. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Another mystery. The first thing that struck Dr. Jim the next day was an alteration in the demeanor of his friend. When Herrick arrived at the Pines after his visit to Corn, the squire had already retired to bed and was asleep, so the servant said. Not wishing to disturb him, Jim had supper all to himself, and went to his own room after a brisk walk on the terrace. It struck him as curious that Stephen did not come down to breakfast the next morning, as he was now comparatively well. On asking for the squire, he was informed that Marsh Carr had gone out for a walk. Herrick, therefore, had another lonely meal, wondering the while what had taken Stephen out so early. The young man did not return till late in the afternoon, and then excused himself by stating that he had been to see Petronella at Beominster. "'She is still in that dull house,' said Marsh Carr gloomily, "'although I think she is tired of it and wants to go to her own country. But she refuses to go all the same.' "'What is her reason?' asked Herrick sharply. I can't get it out of her. She says my mother left a message with her. For you, I suppose. Well, why doesn't she deliver it and get away? The message is for you, Herrick. Jim stared. For me, he cried. Why, what possible message can your poor mother have left for me? I really do not know, replied Stephen indifferently. You had better see Petronella and ask her. She is looking very ill, and if she stays much longer in that damp house, she will die. All right, replied Herrick coolly. I'll look her up some time. I dare say the message is only one asking me to look after you. So Dr. Jim said, but in his heart he was wondering if the dead woman had left behind her any confession of her crime. She might have done so, yet... If she had poisoned herself to escape the consequences, it would have been foolish of her to incriminate herself. Herrick resolved to see Petronella at the first opportunity and learn what it was that she had to tell him. If there were any really important message, it was strange that the old Italian had not delivered it long ago. He had seen her frequently and there had been ample opportunity for her to fulfill her mistress's dying wish. However, Herrick put this out of his mind for the moment and turned his attention to Stephen. "'You are not looking well, Steve,' he said gravely. "'Your face is white. You have dark rings round your eyes and a haggard look as though you had not slept all night.' "'I am not yet quite myself,' said Marsh Carr, in a far more irritable tone than Herrick had ever heard him use before. I can see that, and being someone else has not improved your temper. I hope I have not offended you by going to town, Steve. Certainly not. How can you think so? Well, said Dr. Jim, looking at him, it struck me that you have been trying to avoid me lately. If you are tired of me, Steve, you need only say so, and I'll pack up and go. "'No, I'm hanged if you will,' said the squire vigorously. "'I can't do without you. "'I have been worried a trifle, "'and it has told on my present state of health. "'I'll be all right in a day or so. "'Is there anything I can help you with? "'No, it is a private matter, "'and concerns myself only.' "'In the face of this intimation, "'Herrick could not press his inquiries "'and began to speak on other subjects. "'Stephen replying more or less absently. As soon as he could, he withdrew to his own room, saying he wanted to lie down. Herrick did not seek to detain him, but shook his head. Something is wrong, and he won't tell me what it is, he thought. I wonder if Santiago has been tampering with him in any way. Perhaps Bess may know the reasons 
for this change. I'll see her at once. But the extraordinary thing was that he found Bess changed also. He had left her bright and merry, anxious to probe the secret of Colonel Carr's death. He returned to find her nervous, ill at ease, and disinclined to continue her detective investigations. "'I don't think we shall arrive at anything,' she said, when Herrick pressed her. "'I spoke to Inspector Bridge, and he can do nothing. He's a professional, and if he fails, how can we hope to succeed?' "'Inspector Bridge is a conceited ass,' replied Dr. Jim gravely. He knows absolutely nothing. I know more than he does. Did you see the Mexican and Mr. Joyce? asked Bess. I saw them, and I spoke to them. And I have found out something which I need not tell you just now. It would be useless to do so. I must search out the matter for myself, and when I succeed, you shall know. Bess sighed. I do not mind in the least, she said mournfully. I have ceased to take an interest in the matter. If Frisco did not kill Colonel Carr, I do not know who did. Hmm. You are changeable, like all women, said Dr. Jim, rather puzzled by her attitude, yet never guessing its cause. By the way, did you find out anything about that pistol? Yes. Bess thought she might as well tell him, as he would certainly learn the truth sooner or later from Bridge. The bullet fits the barrel. I thought so, said Jim. It is the weapon which was used. Yes, answered Bess. Then, after a pause, I made another discovery. Oh, you did? And about what, my dear? The bullet which was used. It is of silver. Of silver? What do you mean? Isn't it lead? Bess laughed rather irritably. If it was of lead, how could it be silver? she asked and then went on to tell how the jeweler had examined the missile. "'Isn't it curious?' she said. Herrick nodded absently. His eyes were fixed on the ground, and he was trying to think of the reason Mrs. Marsh could have had for using so expensive a bullet. Certainly the weapon was old-fashioned, and she would have to manufacture the bullets for herself. But why use silver in preference to lead or pewter? In an ordinary household, the supply of the last two metals was likely to be more plentiful than the first. This was a problem, but one of so trifling a nature that Herrick dismissed it almost immediately. He turned his attention to Bess. "'What have you and Stephen been doing with yourselves?' he asked. Bess started violently and changed color at once. "'Nothing, Jim,' she said stiffly. "'Why do you ask?' Well, you both look ill. Stephen is avoiding me, and you are as silent as an owl. Not so stupid, I hope, said Bess with a laugh. At this moment, Ida entered the room, and nothing more was said. But Ida also complained of Stephen's health. I wish you would make him stay in bed, Dr. Jim, she said. I am certain that he has got up too soon, and is not strong enough to go about. Look how pale he is, and silent. I can't get a word out of him. Herrick nodded. I'm not pleased myself, Ida. This comes of my running away to town. I'll exert my authority. He spoke to Stephen, and urged him to lie up for a few days. The young man obeyed meekly enough, and this very meekness made Herrick uneasy. He would rather that Stephen had shown fight, but the squire remained in bed took what was given him, and hardly ever opened his mouth. Ida was in despair. Herrick was puzzled, and the two met to discuss the situation. "'When did he change like this?' asked Dr. Jim. "'I think it was a day after you left,' replied Ida tearfully. "'I went to Bealminster to see Flo, and left him quite bright. When I met him again, he was dull and quiet and white. Yet best was with him while I was away, so he should not have missed me so much. Oh, said Jim, with sudden interest, so Bess was with him, was she? Hmm, it strikes me that Bess herself is not so bright as she might be. Indeed, you are right there, said Miss Endicott. She is sad and silent, just like Stephen, or else she is so gay 
that I think she is too excited. She cries for the least thing and laughs without any cause. Hmm. Sounds like hysteria to me, yet Bess is not given that way. Of course not, said Ida, repelling the suggestion hastily. She is a strong, healthy, sensible girl, and above such weakness. But, as you say, she and Stephen have both changed, I think. Here Ida hesitated and looked down. It amazed Herrick when she looked up to see her eyes were filled with tears. He could not understand it at all. My dear girl, what is the matter? he exclaimed irritably. Are you ill also? The devil has broken loose here since my departure. I, I can't help it, sobbed Ida. I thought that Bess and Stephen might, might like one another. Of course they do, Ida. Why shouldn't they? You don't understand what I mean. I wonder if they were in love with one another and regret their engagements. Herrick burst into such a hearty fit of laughter that she was cheered. I never heard such nonsense in my life, he said. Where is your woman's wit, Ida? Why, Bess loves me devotedly, I am certain. As for Stephen, he adores the very ground you walk on. No, it is not that, my dear girl. Then what can it be? asked Ida, drying her tears. I shall question Bess until I find out, said Herrick grimly. You have no idea how I can torture people with cross-examination. True to his idea, Dr. Jim sought out Bess. He came across her in the pine wood beside the fairy circle. Her eyes were cast on the ground, and she looked despondent. When she saw Herrick, she made as if to go away. Dr. Jim felt wounded. Bess, don't you want to see me? Of course I do, she said brightly, only I'm not very well. Neither is Stephen, said Dr. Jim, and he saw by her start that the remark made her nervous. Have you two quarreled? No, we have not. We are great friends. Are you in love with one another, then? Bess grew crimson and stamped. How dare you say such a thing as that even in jest, she said. What would Ida say if she heard it? It was Ida's own idea, replied Herrick with a smile. Seeing you two so glum, she fancied, that you regretted your engagements and wanted to marry one another. Just say if this is the case, Bess, and Ida and I will console each other. That would be only fair, you know. The first smile that Herrick had seen on her face since his return dimpled the cheek of Bess. I never heard such nonsense. I like Stephen, but you are the man I love. You stupid Jim, you know that. I'm not quite sure if I do, said Jim gravely. In love, there should be complete confidence. Surely there is between us, said Bess nervously. You can't look me in the face and repeat that. Bess made the attempt and failed. It is nothing, she said obstinately. There is something, however, said Dr. Jim sternly. You and Stephen have some secret between you which is making you both ill. What is it? I can't tell you, Jim. Then there is a secret. I won't be questioned like this, cried Bess, with angry evasion. Herrick took the girl by the arm and forced her to look into his face. My dear girl, he said, I am to be your husband and you must obey and consult me in all things. If you are playing with fire, I must know. Do you not trust me, Bess? Yes, but the secret is not my own. In that case, I won't press you for an explanation, he said, relaxing his grip. You are a foolish girl to have any secrets from one who loves you. But I suppose you have given your word not to tell. Yes, I cannot break my word. Herrick nodded. I do not ask you to. The secret of Stephen shall be respected. I do not even ask if it has to do with the murder of his uncle. There is no need to ask. Bess looked at him irresolutely, her face scarlet. Then, without a word, she went slowly away. Herrick looked after her and nodded to himself. I believe she has found out something about Mrs. Marsh 
and has told Stephen that would account for their melancholy and for the secret which he says exists between them. I shall ask Stephen. That same afternoon, Herrick went back to the Pines and into the bedroom of Marsh Carr. The young man was lying, staring at the ceiling. He seemed listless and worn out. When Jim entered, he turned his face toward the wall so as to avoid his friend's eyes. Herrick pretended to take no notice, although he was cut to the heart by the avoidance of his gaze. He was very fond of Stephen, and mourned over this thing which had come between them. However, it was necessary to take extreme measures if the situation was to be improved. Steve, said Herrick, formulating a plan, I can't eat alone any longer. You must come down to dinner tonight. I can't, said Stephen, in a muffled tone. I'm too ill. I know you are. Life and brightness and my society are what you need. I was wrong to send you to bed. As your doctor, I now order you to get up. Stephen turned sulky. I don't want to. You do not know what is good for you, my friend, said Herrick, coolly. I shall expect to find you dressed and down to dinner at eight. After a good meal, you will be more like your old self. In this way, after much coaxing, scolding, ordering, and threatening, Jim got the young man to get up and dress. Marsh Carr did so reluctantly enough, for he was desperately afraid of betraying the secret he had told Bess to the sharp eyes of Herrick. However, he was really tired himself of being alone. This seclusion could not be kept up forever, and it was as well to make a beginning and get back into the old routine. He therefore dressed with some care after a bath, and came down into the drawing-room looking much better. Herrick was standing on the hearth rug, big and masterful. Here you are at last, he said, just in time for a glass of sherry. Stephen protested, but Herrick insisted. You want something to make you eat after being in bed all day. This sherry and bitters will do for a medicine. I want you to eat and drink well tonight, Steve. You must get color into your cheeks and fire into your eye. What will I to say if I attend to you so badly? Stephen drank the sherry and felt better. Then they went to eat a capital dinner, and Dr. Jim saw that his friend tasted every dish. He also made him drink champagne and talked the whole time in a lively way that was infectious. By the time dinner was over, Stephen felt positively happy. Then came cigars, coffee, and cognac in the library. "'Now, Steve, don't you feel better?' said Herrick, when they were seated vis-a-vis -vis beside a blazing fire. "'Yes,' replied the squire, and looking round the gorgeously colored room, at the evidence of wealth and luxury spread out on every hand. I feel immensely better, I suppose. I shall pick up soon. If you follow the advice I shall leave you with, I think you will, said Herrick, with intention, and stared at the fire. What do you mean, Jim? You don't intend to? Ah, but I do, though, Steve. I cannot stay with anyone who does not trust me wholly. I want to be your friend. Your stepmother asked me to look after you. I promised to do what I could. But unless you give me your unreserved confidence, it is useless for me to remain. Stephen rose agitated and began to pace the room. I trust you in every way, Jim. You know I do. I know nothing of the sort, Steve. You trust best, though. Ah, she has told you, cried Marsh Carr angrily. No, she has told me nothing. But I'm not a fool, Steve, and I have eyes in my head. I saw that she was as sad as you, and by putting two and two together, I became certain that there was something between you to make both sad. Bess would not tell me anything, nor did I ask her. She is a loyal little woman. Still from her manner, I guessed. There was a secret. I am certain, added Herrick, looking steadily at his friend, that such a secret can only have to do with the death of your uncle. Now, as I'm looking after this case, 
you must tell me what you know. If you do not, I shall throw up the matter and leave you. I must be trusted all in all, or not at all, my friend. While Herrick was speaking, Stephen had sat down. He changed from red to white, from white to red again, and his breathing became short and hard. He saw that Herrick was in earnest, and that he would either have to tell or lose his friend. In a tumult of anxiety, he rose again and began to pace the room. "'You put me to a hard test,' he cried. "'Perhaps I do,' replied Dr. Jim calmly. "'But it is to prove your friendship and your manhood. "'Tell me the truth.' "'You will despise me if I do,' said Marsh Carr, thoughtlessly, "'and regretted the words almost as soon as they had left his mouth. "'Herrick appeared unmoved, although he was inwardly surprised. "'I do not think anything you could say or do would make me despise you,' he said in his calmest tone. "'I know you too well to think you would do anything dishonorable. Come, what is it?' But Stephen still remained silent, his eyes on the ground. He was debating whether he would go on or not. Herrick saw his hesitation and guessed its cause. "'You have got over the worst now,' he said soothingly. "'Come along, Steve. Sit down and tell me.' "'No,' replied Stephen hoarsely. "'I prefer to stand up.' Then suddenly it was I who fired those three shots into the body of my uncle. "'Was it?' said Herrick quietly. "'And why did you do that?' "'Because I was mad at the time.' "'Had you not better tell me the whole affair? "'Then I shall be in a position to judge of your madness.' Stephen was amazed at the calm way in which his friend took the intelligence. However, he had gone so far that there was nothing left to do but to confess all as he had confessed to Beth. In a hurried manner, the young man repeated the tale and informed Herrick how Bess had found out the truth by means of the revolver. And now you must despise me, was his final remark. He sunk into his chair with a groan. Herrick paused for a moment to think. Then he carefully lighted his pipe. "'I do not despise you by any manner of means,' he said, calmly. "'But I must admit that I think you are quixotic.' The word to Stephen's mind was so inapplicable to the situation that he looked up astonished, scarcely believing his ears. "'Quixotic,' he repeated. "'I do not quite see.' "'Well,' said Herrick, nodding, you see, Mrs. Marsh is dead, so no harm can be done to her. It is good of you to screen her memory. Stop, stop, what do you mean, Herrick? cried the squire, much agitated. I mean that you have taken this guilt on your head to screen your stepmother's memory. Stephen paused, then he looked up resolutely. Yes, he said, I may tell you, if I tell no one else. It was my mother who fired those shots. Bess found out about my pistol, which my mother used, so I took the blame on myself. "'You chivalrous ass,' said Herrick, with a growl. "'And you've been fretting over this? Why didn't you save time by telling me before?' "'I thought, I thought. Never mind what you thought. After you came to seek your mother at the rectory, you did not find her. What did you do?' Stephen stared. "'How do you know that I did not find her there?' he asked. "'I know more than you think. Tell me all that you saw.' "'I saw nothing,' replied Stephen. "'Corn said that my mother had gone to the car arms. I could not find her there. I fancied, in one of her rages, she might have gone up to the pines. I went there, but saw nothing. Then I came back to the car arms and found my mother. She said I had missed her. I thought she spoke the truth. I never questioned her, even after I heard of Carr's death. It never entered my head that she had killed the man. Then how did you guess? It came into my head like a flash when Bess said that my revolver was empty in three chambers. I was certain that when I put it away, the whole six were loaded. Even as Bess spoke, it entered my mind that my mother must have taken the revolver and have gone up after she left the rectory a second time to threaten the colonel. She must have found him dead, 
and then have fired the three shots into his body. Then she replaced the revolver. I never thought of looking at it. It was brought here along with some other things, and it was only when Bess... I see, nodded Dr. Jim. Now look here, Steve. Had your mother another pistol, an old-fashioned horse pistol? No, I am sure she had not. At least, I never saw her with one. It was with such a pistol that Carr was shot. Good heavens, Herrick, you do not mean to say that my mother killed the man? Well, I've heard your account, and I've heard the account of Corn. I don't know how to reconcile the two. Corn? Corn the rector? What has he to do with it? A good deal. So have Joyce and Santiago and others. See here, Steve. I've been searching for evidence in this case for a long time. To spare you, I said nothing. But now that your stepmother has been brought into the matter, it is but right you should know. Sit down. I will tell you a long and interesting story. Rather dazed, Stephen did as he was told. Then Dr. Jim related all that he had learned, bringing the narrative down to the end of his interview with the Reverend Pentland Corn. Now, what do you think, he asked, when the whole story was told? I do not know what to think, my mother. I can't believe that she would. Would? It does seem strange, said Herrick. But I tell you what, it is my opinion that this message Petronella will deliver will tell the truth. End of chapter 21「Twenty Two of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A message from the dead. The old Italian woman looked very ill. Her form was shrunken, her face thin and white, her eyes unnaturally large. Evidently the misty climate of the Midlands chilled her to the bone. She had developed a hacking cough and shook with the ague when the east wind tormented Beominster. Herrick was shocked at the change which had taken place in her appearance during these few short weeks. Apparently Petronella was not long for this world. But the near approach of death did not appall her. She was terribly lonely now that her mistress was gone. Signor Doctore, she croaked, when Herrick made his appearance, you have come to see me. That is good. But you will not cure me. No, I am dead, Signor. Dio mio, what does it matter? She ended with a characteristic shrug, punctuated with a cough. Indeed, you do look ill, Petronella, said Dr. Jim sympathetically. I must ask the squire to send over someone to look after you. No, replied the old woman obstinately. I am well here, and it will not be long, Signor. Soon I shall be in my beautiful Italy. At least come over to the pines, Petronella. You will be better attended to there, and it is warmer. But Petronella crossed herself with pious horror. Go to that devil Casa, Signor, not me. He had the evil eye, that man who died. See, si, Signor, I went one day with Madrona, and he swore at me. I had an accident the next day. Cospetto, e Gettura, that Signor. But come in, come in, Signor Doctore. This is the best room she led Herrick into what once had been the drawing-room. Ah, Bishori di Chiante, Signor? Signor Stephen sent me some Chiante. No, thank you, Petronella, replied Herrick, sitting down on a dusty seat. I want to have a chat with you. We will talk in your own language, if you like. Ah, no, Signor, I speak the English well, thanks be to the saints. My padrona was fond of speaking the English, so we will talk, Signor Doctore. Herrick acquiesced with a shrug. He was quite prepared to talk any language she chose, provided he got what he wanted. He was not very certain how to go about the matter. Petronella was a shy bird and inclined to be obstinate. He felt his way in a roundabout fashion so as to take her by surprise. You'll be glad to get back to Italy, Petronella? Si, si, 
to the little town by the Adriatic. There I was born, Signor, and there I will die. If I die not here, ah, Dio. You are in pain, I fear. Petronella shrugged her lean shoulders. I'm always in pain, she said. My legs and body all pain. But the padrona left me something to take. Thanks be to her. Povera, signora, and the pain goes. Not chloral, I hope. See, si, signor, a little bottle of chloral. I take not much, only when I am bad, so bad. Then the pain goes. Be careful what you do, Petronella. Remember, your mistress died from taking too much. I shall be careful, muttered the old woman. Ah, Dio mio, what does it matter if I die, all alone in this big house, and Signor Stefano away? You saw him the other day, he told me, said Dr. Jim carefully, approaching his business. He told me you had some message for me. Petronella nodded and screwed up her thin lips. Only when he is in danger, Signor, not now, he is too well. What do you mean, Petronella? asked Herrick, puzzled by her nods. Signor Doctore, said Petronella, standing very straight, my padrona, before she died, called to me. She gave me a large letter and told me to give it to the Signor Doctore when Signor Stefano was in danger. Oh? Herrick's eyes flashed. He had always wondered how it was that Mrs. Marsh had died without making any sign. After the conversation she had had with him, he quite expected that she would have left him a farewell message. It appeared that she had done so, but that the letter had been withheld by Petronella according to instructions. When did she write this, Petronella? You said nothing about it at the time. No, I did what I was told to do, Signor. Echo, Signor Dectori. It was in this way. After my padrona got the letter from the postman in the middle of the day, she was very angry and afraid. Afraid? Why was she afraid? She lo sa, shrugged Petronella. She said nothing to me, but she told me to bring pen and ink and paper. All the afternoon she was writing. Ah, uh, how she did write. Then she put all the writing into an envelope, Signor, and wrote our name on it. She told me to give it to the Signor Doctore when Signor Stefano was in danger. She said that Signor Doctore was a good man. I give it to you, Signor, but not now. No, and Petronella, closing her mouth firmly, shook her aged head. I think you had better give it to me this very minute, Petronella, said Herrick, rising, for Signor Stefano is in very great danger indeed. As how? Senor Doctore, he may be accused of murdering his uncle, Colonel Carr. Ah, Dio mio, crowed the old woman. Did I not say that the dead man had the evil eye? Did I not tell the Signora that evil would come to the young Signor from his death? She caught Herrick's arm and fixed her glittering eyes on his face. You swear to me that this is true what you say? Signor Stefano is in danger, eh? Huh? Huh? I swear he is, Petronella, replied Herrick earnestly, and this packet you talk of may save him. Ah, see, si. well do I know, Signor Doctore, that is so. My padrona said that it told how the danger could be set aside. You understand? In this letter, Signor, there is a strange story. Do you know what it is, Petronella? No, Signor Doctore, Padrona did not tell me, but she said it was a strange story, and to be read when my young Signor was in danger. I will go and bring it. La, la, la. It is danger. Dio mio. That wicked Signor who is dead. Burbante, ladroni. The evil eye, the evil eye. Coughing as she went, the old woman hobbled out of the room. Dr. Jim sat still wondering if he was about to learn the truth at last. If Pentland Corn was to be believed, Mrs. Marsh had been at the Pines about the hour when the crime had been committed. Herrick did not now believe that she had killed the man herself, 
as she had been possessed of the modern revolver with which the three shots had been fired. It was impossible to imagine that she had fired one shot with an old-fashioned weapon and had then reverted to the use of the new revolver. No, the first shot, the death shot, had been fired by someone else, possibly by Frisco. Mrs. Marsh had met the assassin in the house, but for reasons of her own had not divulged the name. Also judging from her conversation, she had known a great deal about Carr and Frisco, especially about the latter. Seeing that she had warned Jim that Frisco might attempt to kill Stephen. As a matter of fact, although the man had not struck the blow himself, he had guided the hand of Santiago to strike it. Herrick wondered if Mrs. Marsh would say anything about the Mexican. At all events, I shall know the truth at last, he said. After reading this letter, the mystery will be one no longer. But why did Mrs. Marsh delay such important information all this time? This was a question he could not answer. He was still puzzling over it when Petronella entered the room, carrying a large blue envelope sealed with the car crest. This she handed to Herrick with much ceremony. "'There is my trust, senor,' she croaked. "'Bear witness by all the saints that I gave it only when the young senor was in danger.' "'That is all right, Petronella. I shall read it here. Will you stay?' No, Senor Doctore, I do not want to hear the secrets of my padrona. I go to make myself a meal, Senor. You stay here and read. A glass of wine, Senor Doctore? Ah, uh, por l'amour de Dio, un bichera de Chiante. Herrick politely refused the attention, and Petronella went grumbling out of the room. She was a hospitable old soul, and liked the doctor. When he was alone in that dismal, deserted apartment, he drew up his chair close to the window and opened the envelope. Five or six sheets of closely written paper fell out, also a typewritten letter. After a glance at this last, Dr. Jim smoothed out the paper and began to read. The story, as it might be called, commenced abruptly. This impetuosity was extremely characteristic of Mrs. Marsh. After a glance round the room, Dr. Jim settled to read. The manuscript was as follows. I'm a wicked woman and an evil woman. There, you see, Mr. Herrick, I place my character before you in the first line. I know you are no fool, or I should not make such a confession. But when you read these pages, I shall be in my grave. So what you say or think does not matter. If these pages are made public, there will be blame enough from other people. To save my boy, they must be made public. I can foresee that he will be accused of the murder of that beast Carr. I swear that he is innocent. He knows nothing. From the grave, I send out my voice to defend him. And you are a clever man, Herrick. The defense of my poor boy I confide to you. If you do not do your best, I swear to haunt you, if it be possible for the dead to return. But after all, you are too sensible to be frightened by this talk. Let me get to the facts of the case. Those will interest you more than the ravings of a dying woman. So I begin. I have said that Colonel Carr was a beast. I repeat it. He was a cruel tiger. Rolling in wealth, he refused to give me any money, yet he knew that I was accustomed to luxury and that Stephen was his nephew. No wonder I hated the man. Again and again I implored him, almost on my knees, to allow me sufficient to live on. He always refused with his sneering laugh. Often I wonder that I did not kill him. Yet he had one good point. He had loved his sister, and out of love for her memory, he made Stephen his heir. He also caused him to be educated, but when that was done, he refused to allow him an income to live like a gentleman. I hated Carr for that, even if he had not allowed me money, still his own sister's child should not have felt the pinch of poverty. 
I love Stephen. He's a very kind, good boy, and has put up with my vile temper all these years. Now that he is rich, I hope he will marry Ida, if she does not prefer you, and I do not think that is likely, and live the happy life of a country gentleman. My blessings on them both. To come to the point which I know you want to reach. On the night of Carr's murder, I was at the rectory. It came to my ears through some words dropped by Frisco when he was intoxicated that Carr intended to disinherit my son. Whom he intended to favor, I do not know, nor do I care. But I could not stand meekly by and see the lad robbed of what was righteously his own. I went into Saxon that afternoon to see Carr and to remonstrate against his committing the monstrous injustice he had contemplated. He saw me with the greatest coolness and behaved quite in accordance with his character. In vain did I point out that Stephen was the sole living representative of his blood and was entitled by law to the property. Carr said that he had another relative living, a cousin descended from an uncle of his, who had been turned out of doors by his grandfather. This uncle had married in America and had died, leaving a daughter who married a Yankee. It was the son of this daughter to whom Carr referred as his cousin. Furthermore, he declared that his cousin had a son about the age of my Stephen. I asked him if he intended to leave the property to this cousin and his brat. But this he denied. He said that he had made the money himself and would leave it to whomsoever he pleased. In a word, he defied me. I was helpless. I could do nothing. And that afternoon, I left the Pines mad with rage. After a threat to kill Carr. Needless to say, he laughed at my threat. Why I did not kill him then, you will ask? Because I wanted to give the man one last chance. I warned him that I would shoot him if he persisted in his injustice. I said that I would return that evening for my answer. Then I went to the rectory and had dinner with Pentland Corn. Here, my dear Herrick, I may state that I had brought a pistol with me, or rather a revolver. It belonged to Stephen, who at one time had a craze for shooting. The revolver was put away in its case, which was on the mantelpiece of his study. I remembered that it was there, and on looking I found that all six chambers were loaded. I knew that Stephen never troubled about the weapon, so I took it with me to the Pines. But on that afternoon I did not use it. Carr, I said to myself, should have his chance. Stephen was to come to the rectory for me about nine. Some time before that I told Corn that I would go to the Carr Arms to meet Stephen. But I intended to go up to the Pines. Corn never suspected my intention. I quickly went up to the Pines shortly before nine. I found no one in the lower part of the house. Frisco, I suppose, was sleeping off his drunken fit. As I heard from Napper that he had been drinking in the afternoon and had uttered threats against his master, I knew that if anywhere, Carr would be in the tower. The table was laid out for dinner, but he was not in the dining room. I went upstairs and found him in the tower chamber. He was in evening dress, lying dead with his face downward. I turned him over and saw that he had been shot through the heart. At once, I guessed that Frisco had carried out his threat and had murdered the colonel. But I thought Carr might have altered his will before dying. I was quite mad with rage, thinking he had cheated me. Then I did what you will consider a terrible and barbarous thing. I fired three shots into his dead body. I suppose it was wicked of me, seeing that the man was dead. But I am Italian, as you know, and I was mad with fury at the thought of how this he had treated me. The only revenge I could take was to have my share in his death so I fired three times. It did me good, and I came away much calmer. I see you raise your eyebrows in horror, my virtuous Herrick. Ah, bah! You are English. 
and cold-blooded as a frog. I'm Italian, and I did what I did. I have no other excuse to make. I was only a few minutes in the tower chamber. Then I came down to get away, lest I should be accused of the crime. At the door below I met Frisco. He had his hat and coat on, and a small bundle in his hand. I said, You have killed him. He lies dead upstairs. Frisco denied that he was guilty, and referred to my three shots. I explained, and told him that he could call up the whole countryside to hear what I had done. At the same time, I warned him that as I had found the colonel dead, I would accuse him of the murder. Frisco repeated that he had not killed him, but said he might have done so later on. Carr had treated him so badly. He was entitled to the money. He was a relative of Carr's. I saw at once that this was the cousin and said so. Frisco did not deny it. He told me he would have to go away as he might be accused of the murder and could not afford to remain and face the matter out. But he warned me that if Stephen took the property, he would find means to get rid of Stephen. I laughed at him, but I was afraid. Frisco was almost as big a brute as his master and cousin. Then, seized with a sudden panic, he ran out of the house and into the pine wood. I left also and got down to the car arms, where afterwards Stephen came for me. I told him that I had been there all the time, but that he must have missed me. That is the truth as regards the events of that night. I found Carr dead and in anger. I fired those three shots. Who killed the man, I do not know. I am inclined to believe it was Frisco, in spite of his protestations of innocence. But you know how he ran away. He went to London, and from London he wrote to me. I enclose his letter. The next few days, and the murder was known, I said nothing. I replaced the revolver in its case. I persuaded Stephen that I had not been to the Pines on that night, and he believed me. Then he became possessed of the property on certain conditions. I breathed freely. Carr had not had the time to make a new will, and my boy was safe. So far, so good. Then came the bolt from the blue. I received the enclosed letter from Frisco, in which he threatened to write to the police and denounce me. If he does this, I am lost. It will be difficult for me to defend myself. The evidence against me, if the matter is looked into, will be too strong. But you can see that for yourself, Herrick. So I need not be more explicit. Under these circumstances, and to save Stephen, I have made up my mind to die. If the truth about my visit came to light, even although I were proved guiltless of the murder, Stephen is quite foolish enough to give up the money. He is a good boy, but weak, quixotic. The only way I can save him and myself, also for that matter, is to die. I'm not afraid. I've had such a wretched life that I do not think things will be worse in the next world. Besides the chloral, against the abuse of which you are always warning me, affords me a chance of slipping quietly and painlessly out of a world that is much too hard for me. If I die, Stephen will be safe, for Frisco can do nothing. His threats will fall harmless on the dead. The man is dangerous, though. He might try to murder Stephen. I gave you a hint of that, Herrick, but I know you are clever, and so long as you are with my boy, I do not fear for him in that way. Yet, as regards the rest, it is possible that Frisco may denounce Stephen as guilty of murder. Stephen told me he went to the Pines that night to see if I had gone up there. Someone may have seen him. Then I used his revolver. That would also be evidence against him, and even if I had destroyed the weapon, that would still be evidence against him. While I live, I dare not tell the whole truth. Therefore, I make this confession, and I shall give it to Petronella. She will deliver it to you when danger threatens Stephen. From the contents of this, you will know how to act. So is the thwart Frisco. Stephen is innocent, 
and I verily believe that Frisco is guilty in spite of his denial. I can die in peace now, for I know when this confession is in your hands that Stephen will be safe. I trust to your head and to your heart, Herrick. I am sure you will not fail me. No doubt you think I am going to extremes in dying. That may be, but I am sick of this life. Even if I lived, I should have nothing but trouble. Besides, my poor Stephen has had quite enough of me. I hope he will marry Ida and be happy. Were I to live and remain with them, I should spoil their happiness. What would a sour old woman do with two such lovers? Well, Herrick, I am about to seal this up, and then I shall take a dose of chloral, an overdose. Thus my death will appear to be an accident. The world will think so. I wonder if you will. You also may be deceived. But I think you will be clever enough to doubt the accident. For you know I am not the woman to be careless. Do not show this to Stephen unless you are absolutely compelled. I love the boy, and I want him to think the best of the woman who is gone. So, no more. Good-bye to you, my dear Herrick. You have been a good friend to me. Continue to be so to my boy. Also, if you have any religion, which I doubt, pray for the soul of Bianca Marsh. And here I sign my name for the last time. Bianca Marsh. When Herrick finished this extraordinary document, he laid it down with a sigh for the memory of the wrong-headed, impulsive woman who had written it. She had acted foolishly, but for the best, and since the poor soul had gone to her account, Herrick could not find it in his heart to blame her. After a pause, he took up the typewritten letter. It was typed in purple ink, without date or address, and even the signature of Frisco was in print. It ran as follows. If you do not make your son do justice to me and to my son, I will write and tell the police that you murdered Colonel Carr. I must have half the money left by Carr allowed to me by arrangement. You can answer my letter by an advertisement in the Daily Telegraph. Then I will write to you and make arrangements. All I want to know now is whether you insist upon your son giving the money, or face the disgrace of being arrested for the murder. I have a witness who can prove your presence in the house. If necessary, I will come forward and give myself up. I can save myself and condemn you. Choose. I shall look every morning in the paper. Frisco. Herrick read this precious letter over twice. He wondered that it was typed instead of written. Not that he did not see the reason for this, but that he wondered how a hunted fugitive like Frisco could procure a machine. Then the truth flashed into his mind. Robin, said Herrick, rolling up the papers. Frisco met him, went to his chambers, and disclosed the fact that he was his father. Ha! Between the two of them, they wrote this letter so as to frighten Mrs. Marsh into giving them the money through her influence over Stephen. Robin typed the letter and sent it. Little scamp! He did not tell me that. Hmm. I shall go again to town and see him. Then Frisco must be produced from his hiding place. Robin can and shall do that. This is all very well, but still the mystery of Carr's death was unsolved. Mrs. Marsh was innocent. She declared Frisco to be guilty. On the face of it, he was. But Herrick had his doubts. The case was getting more difficult at every fresh discovery. For the first time, he mistrusted his own powers of dealing with the matter. I must consult Stephen and Bess, said Dr. Jim, and left the house in his pocket was the confession of the late Mrs. Marsh. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of the Silver Bullet by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The unexpected happens. For the next twenty-four hours, Doctor Jim kept his counsel. He said sufficient to set Stephen's mind at rest about his mother. 
but did not tell the whole story or show the confession which he had obtained from Petronella. He wanted to turn matters over in his own mind before doing this. The fact is, Jim was getting a little weary of the whole affair. Every new piece of evidence that came to light seemed only to complicate it. He felt sure that the paper left by Mrs. Marsh would solve the mystery, but although it told much, it did not reveal all. She declared, in a half-hearted sort of way, that Frisco was guilty. But she gave no proofs. The man in that hurried conversation at the door had denied the charge, and beyond the fact of his flight there was no evidence against him. It occurred to Jim that the best thing to do would be to drop the matter altogether. It seemed useless to follow such a will of the wisp. Still, I do not like to do this on my own responsibility, he thought, after much consideration. It will be best for me to lay all the facts before Bess and Stephen, and go by what they say. If they want to go on with it, well and good. If not, I shall end it at once. With this idea, a most sensible one under the circumstances, Herrick called a council of war. Bess came over from Biffstead and met Stephen and Jim in the library by appointment. There Herrick again told the whole story of his dealings with the matter, and ended by placing Mrs. Marsh's letter and its enclosure before them. When the squire and Bess had read the documents and were in possession of all the facts connected with the murder of Colonel Carr, Herrick made a speech to them on that basis. It seems to me, he said, that it is foolish going on with this matter. For all that I can see, Frisco is the guilty man. But he has disappeared, and I do not think it is worth while hunting him down. To hang him for the murder of a scoundrel like Carr. I beg your pardon, Steve, but your late uncle was a scoundrel. Will be no gratification to any of us. Moreover, if he were caught and tried, this letter might have to be produced. I think it best to stop short at this point. Before Stephen could give his opinion, Bess interrupted him to dwell, after the custom of a woman, on a minor point. You foolish boy, she said, in reproachful tones, I see that you took the blame of your mother's doings on yourself. That was stupid. You might have trusted me. My dear Bess, I could not blacken her memory even to you. Perhaps not, but I should have understood. Now that I think of it, she added, I wonder that I was so foolish as to believe you. It was entirely opposed to your nature to fire at a dead man. Stephen winced. Do not say anything more about it, Bess, he said. She did that. Let the matter rest there. And now, about continuing the search, I agree with Jim. It is best to do nothing more. I am not so sure of that, replied Bess obstinately. You see, Santiago may still try and get the money. No, said Jim positively. I do not think so. He has been found out. His conspiracy is at an end. He knows that any further move on his part will meet with failure. Believe me, he will return to Mexico and give up fighting. The wisest thing he can do. What about Joyce? asked Marsh Carr. He is worse than useless. Take away Don Manuel and Joyce is lost. He has neither the pluck nor the intelligence to carry through a plot on his own account. But his father Frisco may use him as an instrument. Frisco has to clear himself first. Joyce knows if he does anything with his father that I can have him arrested. Rather than that should happen, I believe he would give up Frisco to justice. Bess shuddered. His own father, she exclaimed. Oh, as to that, you can hardly blame Joyce if he does not feel particularly filial. His father has done nothing for him. Besides, Joyce Sr. deserted his wife and Robin was devoted to his mother. It is one of the best traits in his otherwise poor character. No, Bess, I think if Robin came to choose between his own skin and that of Frisco, his father would be the one to suffer. Robin believes in everyone for himself. 
He's a wicked little wretch. He is and he is not, weak rather than wicked. His scheme to mix you up in the murder by means of that pistol was invented by the Mexican. Joyce only did as he was told. But in that case, said Stephen, looking up, I do not see what Santiago had to gain. Robin wanted best to marry him. He wanted to inveigle her into the case so that she might not refuse out of fear. But what would that matter to Santiago? Her marriage with Joyce would not have helped on his schemes. True enough, said Herrick musingly, but I dare say it was Frisco who suggested the marriage. He wanted to get the money through his son, and perhaps thought he would get more if he put off Robin with Bess. Miss Endicott reddened. Thank you for nothing, Jim, she said indignantly. I was evidently to be a pawn in the game. It seems to me that we all have been pawns, said Jim grimly. Just consider the mistakes that have been made while we have been searching for the true assassin of Colonel Carr. Bess laughed. First of all, I was suspected, she said. Oh, no, that was only a half-hearted attempt on the part of Frisco and his precious son. There was no real evidence to implicate you, Bess, I think, speaking for myself, that I first suspected Robin Joyce. It was your remark about his income, Stephen, that aroused my suspicions. Well, the chain runs as follows, and Herrick ticked off on his fingers. Joyce first, on the authority, mainly, of the pistol. He said he got it from the Don, so I suspected Manuel. He proved his innocence and accused Pentland Corn. I saw him, and he told me he had picked up the pistol on the lawn of this house. It was his belief that Mrs. Marsh was guilty. And myself, said Stephen with a smile. No, you were like Bess, and came into the matter on your own account. I never believed you had anything to do with the affair. But your stepmother is the last whom I believed might have something to do with it. Certainly she had. But from her letter we know she didn't kill the man. And here we come to a dead stop. What about Frisco? said Marsh Carr. I believe he is the guilty person, said Dr. Jim positively. Are you going to defend him, Bess? The girl looked troubled. I admit that matters look black against him, she said slowly. He threatened the colonel. He was alone in the house with him, and Mrs. Marsh found him ready to fly. On the other hand, there is something to be said in his favor. Evidently, he should have had a share in this treasure. For some reason the colonel would not give it to him during his life, and only afforded him a chance of getting it after Stephen's death. Not even then, interrupted Herrick, for if Stephen had fulfilled the conditions of the will, the fortune would become his absolutely, and he would be able to will it away. Then I can't understand it, said Bess, unless Frisco knew of this unjust will, for that it is. If he helped to get the treasure and murdered the colonel out of revenge. I believe he did, said Stephen. No, put in Dr. Jim briskly. I do not agree with you. It is my opinion that what Mrs. Marsh said to me before she died was the right view. What was that? Frisco and the colonel fought a duel. I believe that Frisco came back from the inn drunk and filled with fury against the colonel. It might have been that through the visit to Mrs. Marsh in the afternoon, he had found out all about the will. The colonel probably defied him, and then Frisco would suggest a duel. He fired first, and the colonel fell with a still-loaded weapon in his hand. That is all theory, said Bess, still defending the ex-sailor. But you seem to forget, Jim, that the death shot was fired with that clumsy pistol. If there had been a duel, Frisco would have had at least as good a weapon as the colonel. There are plenty of revolvers of the new pattern in the gun room. I am sure Frisco would not have placed himself at such a disadvantage. And again, the silver bullet. Why should Frisco have used that? Dr. Jim rubbed his head with a vexed air. I am afraid you are right, Bess, he said. A duel is out of the question. 
I can't see anything ahead. As far as I'm concerned, I give up trying to solve the riddle. So do I, said Marsh Carr. I know now that my poor mother did not kill the man. So that is all I care about. Let the matter rest, Herrick. You can send Santiago to Mexico, I suppose. Yes, but I think he will want some money. Give him what he wants and let him go. I think that will be best, and as for Joyce, I'll see that he keeps quiet. Bess struck in. What about Frisco? He must look after himself, said Dr. Jim. Innocent or guilty, we can do nothing with him so long as he remains in hiding. But you can find him? Through Joyce, yes, I can. But on the whole, I prefer to let sleeping dogs lie. No, Bess, the whole thing is ended. Now comes the peaceful times. It is necessary to cultivate our garden, as says Voltaire. Stephen laughed. I think so, too, said he. For my part, I intend to put the whole matter out of my head and arrange with Ida as to the date of our marriage. As my poor mother has died so lately, we can have a quiet wedding, but married I shall be as soon as I can. Why? asked Bess. In the first place, I want Ida to be my wife because I love her dearly, and in the second, I want to marry her and make my will after the marriage in her favor. Why can't you make it now? It would not be legal. Marriage invalidates a will. Herrick, who had been thinking, looked up with bright eyes. Stephen, he said, you are afraid of Frisco? Yes, I am. He may try and murder me to get the money. So by marrying Ida and leaving it to her, I shall put the matter out of his power. Once he gets to know that the money has gone from him forever, he may leave me alone. He tried through Santiago to kill me once and failed. He may not fail the second time. There's something in that, said Herrick, and then the council of war, as best called it, broke up. The final decision of the three was to let the case stand where it was. They washed their hands of the whole affair. For the next fortnight there was absolute peace. Stephen and Ida arranged to be married in two months, and Dr. Jim began to talk of his future with Bess. Jim did not want to live with Stephen after the marriage, and yet he could not leave him without forfeiting his income. Of course Stephen insisted that Herrick should take a certain sum a year until he got on his feet, but Jim would not consent to this. I can't take money I do not work for, he said decisively. If you will lend me a small sum, I'll go back to London and start a practice in a new place. I expect it will be a long time before I'm able to marry Bess, but she will wait for me. Bess expressed herself favorably on this point. She would wait for Jim till her hair grew gray, and meantime she could manage Biffstead for Frank after Ida was settled at the Pines. Neither Stephen nor Ida could do anything with this obstinate couple, and they gave up the attempt in despair. But I think it is an infernal shame. You're leaving me in the lurch, said Stephen. Remember what my mother said. Oh, I intend to see you through this year in case Frisco should attempt to stop your visits to the vault, replied Jim. But after that, I must go and carve out my own fortune. Well, who knows what may happen by then, said Marsh Carr. He was determined in some way to benefit Jim. I'll have to force the money on the fellow, he grumbled to Ida. Bess is just as obstinate, she sighed. However, they will be with us for some months yet. Wait and see, Stephen. Herrick, meanwhile, was priding himself that all was at an end. He wrote to Joyce, stating that he intended to do nothing, and also let Santiago know his decision. From neither did he receive an answer. But this he did not mind. They are powerless to do harm, he said to Bess. And indeed, he never expected to hear of the pair again. But one morning Bess came to him with a daily telegraph and pointed out in silence a cipher message in the agony column. 
It was worded similarly to that put in before, and asked Frisco to meet the inserter at Hyde Park Corner at three o'clock in two days. Hmm, said Jim meditatively. Robin wants to see his father again. What will you do, Jim? asked Bess anxiously. Nothing. Why should I? If Robin meets his father, they will plot against Stephen. They can't do anything but physical harm, and I'm always with him. But Bess was not to be put off in this way. I really think you should write to Mr. Joyce about it, Jim. He will not answer. Perhaps not, but he will see that you have your eye on him. True enough. I'll see to it, Bess. Jim fully intended to do so, but foolishly put off the matter for a few hours. He wrote to Joyce only on the day before the appointed meeting, and on the next day received a telegram to the effect that it was not Joyce who had inserted the cipher, nor so, said the wire, had Don Manuel. What the devil does this mean, said Jim to himself? Is it a lie or a truth? If a lie, Manuel and Joyce are plotting. If true, someone else is taking a hand in the game. I'll see Bess. The advice of Bess was that Jim should go up to town without delay. I am sure there's some mischief brewing, she said. You had better go up by this afternoon's train. No, said Jim after a pause. I'll see Steve first. He must know all about this before I go. In fact, I think I'll take him with me. But he has gone away for the day, said Bess. You know he went out cycling with Ida. He won't be back all day. You have no time to lose. I'll wait until he comes back, said Herrick. I'll tell you what, Bess. This may be a scheme to get me away from Stephen in order that they may try and hurt him during my absence. After that assault of Manuel's, I'm never easy in my mind away from the boy. I can't leave him here. If I go up to town, he must come with me. Bess was struck by this view of the matter. There might be something in it, she thought. The consequence was that Herrick waited the return of Stephen and arranged to go up to town with him the next morning. All the same, Stephen laughed at Dr. Jim. You are a perfect old woman about me, he said. I can look after myself. I am sure you can deal with an honorable foe, said Jim, but here there is every probability that you may be struck in the dark. Stephen shrugged his shoulders. Very well, Jim, you know best. We can go to town by the midday express tomorrow. But before they left the Pines, they received the surprise. In the Times newspaper, which usually arrived shortly after eleven, Stephen found some news which surprised him. He went at once in search of Dr. Jim and found him buttoning his gloves on the doorstep, waiting for the cart to come round. "'What do you think of that, Herrick?' said the squire. "'The devil,' said Jim. And, well, he might. There was a paragraph in the paper to the effect that the man called Frisco, who was wanted for the murder of Colonel Carr of Saxon, had been captured on the preceding day. No further details were given, but what Herrick read was quite sufficient. He dropped the paper and stared at Stephen. "'Shall we need to go up to town now?' asked the squire. "'Yes, we must catch this train. Here comes the cart. I shall go and see Joyce at his flat. He may know what this means.' "'What about Bess?' asked Stephen. "'We have no time to talk over the matter with her now.' She will see the news in the telegraph. We can send her a wire from Beelminster Station. Not to worry herself. Jump in, Steve. In a few minutes they were driving hard for the cathedral city. At the station, Herrick sent the proposed wire to Biffstead, and they caught the express. We shall be in town for a few days over this, said Herrick, when they were comfortably settled. I think I can see. See what? asked Marsh Carr. What it means? This is the revenge of that blackguard Santiago for losing the money. Do you think he put in the cipher? I am sure he did, and gave the information to the police meantime. No doubt when Frisco arrived at the rendezvous, 
thinking to meet his son, he was arrested by officers in plain clothes. I have not much sympathy for Frisco, who I fear is a bad lot. All the same, it is hard that he should be tripped up in his stride by that brute of a greaser. It might be so. I wonder if Don Manuel has stayed to see the matter out. It is the kind of thing he would like to do. Oh, I am sure of that, Steve. All the same, he wants to look after his own skin. When Frisco is tried, he will tell all he knows about the Mexican's doings out of revenge. Santiago can't face an inquiry, as you know. His assault on you is enough to get him into serious trouble. No, my friend, Don Manuel has done his mischief and cleared out. By this time he's on his way to the new world. Beast, muttered Herrick between his teeth, I should like to make it hot for him. On arriving in town, Herrick sent Stephen with the luggage to the hotel in Jeremy Street, and himself drove off to West Kensington. He learned from the porter that Joyce was in, and ran upstairs. In a few minutes he was seated in the little man's drawing-room, listening to his reproaches. "'I did not think you would sell me like this, Herrick,' said Robin, wringing his hands in his usual womanish way. "'Whatever I may have done to you, you should have kept faith with me. You always pretended to be so superior.' "'Ah, did I?' said Herrick calmly, but a trifle bewildered at these accusations. "'And now, perhaps, you will tell me what I have done.' You know well enough. You put that cipher in the paper and betrayed my unfortunate father. I did not think it of you. He was arrested at Hyde Park Corner? Yes, at three o'clock yesterday, of course. He thought I put the cipher in and came to meet me. But why do I tell you all this? You are perfectly well aware of the success of your treachery. Herrick shrugged his shoulders. At the present moment, he did not think it necessary to correct the man. How about your friend, Santiago? I wish he was here to punish you, cried Joyce venomously. He was quite as clever as you, Herrick, but you waited till he sailed, before plotting to capture my father. So the Don has sailed. When did he go? Four days since, replied Robin, dropping into a chair, as if you didn't know. Why do you come here to exalt over me? Because I wish to tell you that you are wrong in thinking I put that cipher in the paper. As I wrote to you from Saxon, I decided to let the matter rest. Whether your father was guilty or innocent, I did not care, so long as you and he left Marsh alone. The man who put that into the paper was Santiago. I do not believe it. Herrick shrugged his shoulders. As you please but it is true for all that. I know the cipher, but I give you my word I did not insert it. You knew the cipher, and I am sure you did not use it to betray your father. The only other person who knew it was the Don, and he has left this last sting behind him out of revenge for losing the money. Robin shook his head. I might believe that, he said, if I did not know it was you. "'But I tell you it was not,' cried Jim impatiently. "'It was, it was, those private detectives who worked for you told me all about it. You told them to have my father arrested.' "'Belcher and Kidd?' cried Herrick, jumping up. "'Ah, you know the name. Yes. They gave notice to the police and had my poor father taken. I guess it was their work and through you.' Dr. Jim stood for a moment in a brown study. He saw well enough what had occurred. The ferret had made use of Santiago to find out the business, and knowing of the reward, he made use of the information extorted from Santiago. I expect they let him leave England on condition that he told them the business and helped them to trap Frisco by means of the cipher. The scoundrels! Well, said Robin, what are you going to do now? I'm going to see Belcher and Kidd, said Herrick, and I tell you, Robin, that your friend Santiago has done all this. I have had no hand in it. But why should Santiago? You had better ask your father that, said Herrick. I suspect he has no cause to love that Mexican. 
You can believe me or not, Robin, but the truth is the truth. I have not played you false. Robin shook his head. He still doubted. Jim tried no longer to convince him, but left the flat to have it out with the treacherous firm he had employed. End of chapter 23